It sounds a little scary, actually. <laughs> it does. Nobody really truly likes to look within themselves. Right. Because they know that they'll find scary things in there. Yeah. Honestly, that's what this step is all about. Has your marriage been shattered by sexual betrayal? Are you wondering if it's possible to save your marriage? Or even if you want to? Your story matters, and there is hope for your marriage through Christ Jesus. Welcome to Beyond Broken Vows podcast. I'm Johnny. I'm Emily. And friends, we've been where you are. Our marriage vows were shattered by adultery fueled by pornography. But through a commitment to recovery, our faith in God, and our hope for redemption, we set out on a journey of healing. Now our marriage is better than we ever could have imagined, and we give God all the glory. On our show, we'll talk through difficult topics, infidelity, porn addiction, recovery, and more. So if you're ready to move from pain-filled todays into hope-filled tomorrows, grab your favorite beverage and spend a little time with us. Marriage is redeemed. Hearts renewed. On Beyond Broken Vows Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Yes, welcome back. We hope you had a chance to listen to our special episode last week where we took a break from the Sex Addicts Anonymous Steps to Recovery to share how we navigated the holidays after D-Day, especially at Christmas time. Yes, the holiday season, like we said last week, can be quite challenging for some folks, and it was challenging for us for a period of time. But we're living in a much different place now with some healing, with some recovery behind us. And each day has its own challenges, but it doesn't have the same challenges that it once did. That's true. Life is always going to have its challenges, but we're really glad that the ones that we had five years ago are no longer there. That's correct. Before we get into our topic for today, we do want to share this five-star review from Minecraft 10253. And she titled this, Honest and Most Relatable Podcast I've Found. And she says, your story and the way you tell it has been so helpful for me. I've listened to all of them, but plan to now re-listen to them with my husband. Thank you. Thank you, Minecraft10253. What a wonderful review and a terrific idea to re-listen to them with your spouse. I think that's great. I agree. Thank you so much for taking the time to leave that review. Men, are you spending a lot of time looking at pornography? perhaps even hours each day for your own sexual satisfaction, only to find that it isn't as satisfying as you thought. Are you going back for more? Are you involved in a relationship, be it emotional or physical, with someone who is not your wife? Are you feeling out of control and you don't know how to stop? I was addicted to pornography from the time that I was eight years old, using the images to masturbate in order to manage my emotions in difficult times. When that was not enough, I turned to fantasy and ultimately to sexual relationships outside my marriage. Eventually, I was discovered during my last adulterous relationship and my life and marriage came crashing down. The devastation that my destructive behaviors and choices caused brought betrayal and brokenness to my wife and my family. I came to believe that I was a sex addict and I needed help to set my life and marriage right again. I found a recovery program and gained freedom from my addictive sexual behaviors once and for all. I want you to know that you don't have to go back to pornography or any other destructive sexual behaviors to find emotional manageability and self-satisfaction. I've been pornography-free for five years now. My marriage has been restored, and my life is better than it ever has been before. Come right now to coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com and see if my coaching program is the help that you need. That's coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com. Thank you, Johnny. That's great. I hope many more people will take you up on that because it's so important to have help through that difficult process. So, Emily, previously we had covered steps one, two, three of Sex Addicts Anonymous Recovery. And when we have come to a point where we admit that we're powerless over our addiction, that our life had become unmanageable, we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore our sanity. And then we take all of that and we turn it over to the care of God as we understand him. We're now ready to take step four. And those three, from what I understand, are the beginning, the jumping off place for the next, what is it, four, five, six, seven? Eight and nine. Eight and nine. Okay. That's right. So those are more of the nitty gritty working it out steps, right? That's correct. Okay. 
The most important thing to remember about steps one, two, and three, these are the three steps to surrender. Once surrender has taken place, you're ready to take a look inside and tinker around and figure out what's been going on so that you can start to move forward. Every one of these steps are forward steps, but this one really gets into it and starts to, in some ways, unravel your life from what it once was so that you can look at it for what it truly is and then start to put it all back together in a very healthy way. Awesome. So the Green Book of Sex Addicts Anonymous says, in taking the fourth step, we begin to know ourselves for who we really are. Building on the foundation of the first three steps, we take stock of the feelings and patterns that have shaped our lives. We come to realize that our addiction is more than just unmanageable sexual activities. It includes an entire system of underlying thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. If we neglect this inventory, we risk being stuck in our old habits and mistaken beliefs, and our unexamined defects of character will eventually lead us to relapse. By looking honestly at our moral nature, the failings that kept us trapped in our addiction, as well as our virtues and aspirations, we start to move away from being self centered toward being God-centered. The fourth step takes courage because we are gradually giving up our old rationalizations, dishonesty, and self-pity in order to discover the truth about who we are. In the process, most of us find ourselves peeling away many layers of denial. Our distorted view of ourselves led us to avoid responsibility for our actions. Our denial about our addictive behaviors prevented us from seeing our faults. At the same time, our belief that we were horrible people kept us from believing that we could ever change or be deserving of a better life. In taking the fourth step, we become willing to challenge these old ways of thinking and examine ourselves with a new clarity. Wow, that is amazing. I think this is going to be great. It sounds like it's going to be a difficult step to take, but you know, with God, Everything is possible. Yes. And we should probably stop right now and ask him into this. Absolutely. Let's do that now. Father, thank you so much for this day that you have given to us. This day is the day that we get to talk of how wonderful you are in the way that you have interacted in our lives. We have searched out who we are in light of who you are so that we can find a new way of living through honestly looking at ourselves. Thank you that you are a perfect mirror of reflection that we can look to you to see who we really are because our identity now is in you when we surrender to you and to your way. Father, as we unfold this topic for today, I pray, Lord, for your grace and mercy that they would go with us each step of the way. May you pour out your grace and mercy on us today as we walk through this. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Johnny, why don't you go ahead and tell us exactly what step four says? I'm glad to, because step four was pivotal for me. How so? It helped me understand how I got to where I was. As I have said in other episodes, I really believed that I was a man of good moral character. I believed that I was a man of integrity. I believed that... I chose to do the right thing most of the time. I knew that I had issues or problems, that I made mistakes, but obviously I had something much deeper going on inside that I ended up having to not just confess to you, but to admit that I had an addiction in my life that I was powerless over. And it wasn't even until it was revealed to me that I possibly might be a sex addict that I even understood that was even possible to be that. Mm. So step four really helped me dig into myself. And so I'm excited to outline this process. Surrendering to God is the first most important step. But the real revelation comes after the surrender, when we sit with God and allow him to see inside of us, speak to us, be willing to listen to what he's saying and take it like a man. <laughs> And then do something about it. We got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we go. Step four of recovery says, made a searching 
and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Okay, wow. It sounds a little scary, actually. <laughs> it does. Nobody really truly likes to look within themselves. Right. Because they know that they'll find scary things in there. Yeah. Honestly, that's what this step is all about. We're going to go in and look at the scary things, and we're going to figure out how to not be afraid of them anymore. As we look at that phrase, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, the first thing that hits us is there's a moral inventory that needs to be taken. Stores take inventory all the time, either monthly, quarterly, or yearly, and they write it down. They match it up against the way they think it's supposed to be. To see how much is missing. And then to reconcile. That's essentially what we're doing. Okay. Figuring out what we have right now, matching up against what we thought it was, and then figuring out where the deficiencies are from there. To define moral inventory, it is a systematic examination of all the beliefs, feelings, attitudes, and actions that have shaped our lives from the earliest years. And that comes straight out of the Green Book. But the next two things inside of that statement, there is a searching and fearless action. Searching speaks to the depth and the honesty of our self-reflection. And the fearless part means that we're not letting fear keep us from seeing the truth about ourselves. Yeah, I think that's probably a really tough thing for most people and for addicts, probably, especially right. to really overcome that fear mm -hmm. of seeing who they really are. Right. And if our listeners have been tracking with us thus far, there's a lot of willingness that has to happen. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to search, but you have to be willing to search deeper than you think you could have ever gone. And you have to be fearless about it because you will find things about yourself that frankly are going to terrify you. And you're going to need the help of your higher power to move you through this, which is why steps one, two, and three are so important. Yes. What a great system. So inside of this moral inventory, there's two parts to it. The two biggest parts of a moral inventory are your character defects and your character assets. Inside of character defects, there is also resentments. And that played a big part in my life. Yeah, so let's go ahead and break all that down. Okay. Character defects are the flaws in our moral nature that prevent us from aligning ourselves with God's will. They are expressions of our willfulness. Again, out of the Green Book. In that statement, it's telling us that there are flaws in our moral nature. Flaws? We have flaws? <laughs> really? <Right? laughs> but also that these flaws are preventing us from aligning ourselves with God's will. Yeah, that's really important. And that these flaws are expressions of our own willfulness. Our own willfulness finds us in contrast to God's will. Like we spoke about in step three, the second most powerful force in the universe is the will of man, second only to that of God. Right. So if we don't have that surrender that you talked about in the first three steps, then this step is going to be pretty impossible to do correctly. Absolutely. Matter of fact, if you don't have a good understanding of steps one, two, and three, and surrender has not taken root, you're going to find step four, five, six, seven, and eight really difficult to do. So if you haven't gotten that to surrender point, consider reflecting on that again and taking some more time to spend there because you'll need it moving forward. All right, with that being said, there is in Sex Addicts Anonymous and with uh, some of the other recovery programs, a list of character defects. Right, and I think you can just go to the internet and get a list for that, right? Yes, as a matter of fact, you can just put in the search bar character defects. It's what I did. Initially, my first set of character defects came through my sponsor. He was like, here, I need to give you this. Take a look at this and get back with me. The list that I was giving had 127 listed character defects. Wow. And you start to think, good Lord, I didn't know we could be so defective. But not all of these defects necessarily apply to you. So the list has 127. And because we're unique individuals, we're going to be defective in our own unique way. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for hope? The instructions were for me to read the list all the way through first, and then go back through with a highlighter 
and mark every one of them that I believed pertained to me. So, Johnny, how many did pertain to you? <laughs> I marked 102 of the 127 available. Ouch. And I presented that to my sponsor, and he was like, okay, now I want you to go back, read it again, and pick the top 10 that speak the most to you. Everything else is just damaging self-talk. Okay, that's a good point. That makes it a lot more manageable. Absolutely it does. Who wants to deal with 102 character defects? The idea of getting it down to 10 gives you a place to start. But if you go through this list and you don't find any more than 20 that pertain to you, you've still got some denial going on. Mm -hmm. I will say that much. There's no need to bludgeon ourselves, but we do need to be realistic if step four is going to have any meaning to us whatsoever. Johnny, you mentioned a few minutes ago that there are also resentments that go hand in hand with the character defects. Absolutely. I did not even know how damaging resentments were in my life. And I didn't really understand how many of them I was carrying around. Is that the same thing as saying carrying a grudge? That's a really good question. And to me, at face value, it seems as though they are quite similar, although I haven't really taken the time to peel the two apart. But yeah, I suppose if you're carrying a grudge, that's really something powerful that you carry with you for a long time, pretty much everywhere you go. And that's the same thing as a resentment. When you have a resentment, it does go with you everywhere. Think of resentments through this story that I was told once in a seminar. A man gets up in the morning, dresses, puts on his coat, goes down for breakfast, and he makes note man, this breakfast smells bad. Man, I can't take it. And in his disgust, he gets up and he leaves the table and he goes to work. He gets on the bus and starts riding to work. And he's sitting there, man, it smells bad on this bus. Do these people not wash? It's just horrible on here. So he gets to work and he goes into work and he sits at his desk and he's doing, man, it really smells here too. And it seems that no matter where he goes, It just smells bad. So he just goes home and he gets undressed, takes his coat and sets it down. But he notices that it seems to be weighted to one side. And when he reaches into the pocket, he finds Limburger cheese in his pocket. It was himself that smelled bad. The observation is that he did not notice that he was the one that smelled bad. And how much damage was he doing everywhere he was going with the odor of that Limburger cheese? Yeah, that's really gross. And it reminds me of one time when I got some dog poop on my shoe. (laughs) And I couldn't figure out why everything smelled bad wherever I went (laughs) until I realized, wait a minute. I've been smelling this for like a couple of hours and I checked my shoe and there it was. So resentments are a lot like that. There's something that we carry with us and we really need to look into those and learn to unlock them. Resentments are the way that people or places or things have hurt us, experiences that did some damage to us internally. Resentments have a lot in common with comparison as well, as when you find yourself not like others, you don't do something like others. Somebody may be highly achieving, so you can resent them for their high achievement when really you're upset with yourself for not achieving at the same level. That's where a a resentment lives. Resentments are really where you're feeling inadequate to the world around you. Or maybe even just offended because it's not working out the way you think it should. Correct. Or even fearful in your own environment. I'll just lay out one of my own resentments. One that presented itself for the longest time was a resentment against law enforcement. What was that resentment towards law enforcement, honey? I just thought I hated cops. Mm. Right? It just like, oh man, who needs the cops? You don't want that. Although understanding we need to have police in our world, we have to have that. And yet on the other term, it's like, who needs cops? There's never one around when you need one, that kind of thing. And as I started unfolding my resentment, as my sponsor helped me, I was able to take that back to an event when my mom got pulled over by a small town police officer for speeding. I was around 15 years old at that time. I had my learner's permit and I was watching everything that mom did while she drove, watch everything dad did while he drove. I'm looking over, seeing the speed limit and seeing the speed that they're going. She gets pulled over. She's not actually speeding, but they gave her a ticket for it. 
And the officer was really rude and mean. And that was the experience that I took away from that. And I understood from that point on that cops are mean. They're unjust. And out of that, as I lived my life in my own dishonesty, what I came to understand is that I wanted to be able to be like they were and get away with it. I witnessed one time two motorcycle cops drag racing off of a stoplight. It was early morning. I happened to be at a convenience store. They were side by side and the light turned green and wham, they took off. In my mind, I was disgusted. How can these police officers do that? They're supposed to be upholding the law. How many times did I drag race myself off the line, (laughs) right? But then we know that if we get seen by a police officer doing that, we're going to get a ticket or go to jail. But if we watch the police officer doing it, what do we get? We get a resentment. (laughs) That's what we get. Why? Because when I came to believe internally that I couldn't trust police officers to uphold the law that they were meant to, I didn't feel safe anymore. Mm. I felt fearful because it's like they can make up their own rules. When are they going to make up a rule that puts me in jail? I don't feel safe around police officers. But here's the other thing. That's not every police officer. But I was projecting my resentment onto all of them, saying to myself and others around me that I was spewing to me and my Limburger cheese, (laughs) cops stink, who needs them? So understanding where my problem was with that resentment is that it made me afraid. It made me feel insecure. It was really a fear that held me in that resentment. So that's all part of unlocking the character defects, understanding what's really at the root of it. When we make our list of resentments, we need to make a list of who we resent or what we resent. The second part of that list is why we resent it. When you list why you resent what you put on the list, you need to be specific. This is where you have to be honest with yourself. So instead of just saying, that person hurt my feelings, that person was just being a jerk, the government isn't fair. Those are generalities. Be specific. I had a resentment against our government because of my military service that I carried with me for a long time. I had a lot of resentments tied to 9-11, which I was able to peel all the way back to the fact that I should have been able to do more to prevent it. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? My heart wanted to, but there's no way I could have done more to prevent it. Okay, so some helpful things to know when you're making your lists of character defects and resentments Just understand that this is a list, not the list. This is just where you're getting started. It's helpful to look at this as an onion peeling process. You've heard that analogy before. You're going to remove one layer and there's another layer underneath it. And lots of times that next layer is going to make you cry. (laughs) (laughs) The next thing is, and we read this from the Green Book, but I'll say it again, to neglect this inventory is to risk staying stuck in the behaviors that keep us in our addiction. Haven't you given me an analogy about that before, honey? Yes. As a matter of fact, my sponsor helped me talk this one out. It's called being a dry drunk. And what does that mean? Think about it from an Alcoholics Anonymous standpoint. They have a saying when it comes to stop drinking, you just put the plug in the jug. Just stop drinking. That's the essence of sobriety when you stop the acting out behavior. But if you don't look into the character defects and the resentments, you can still move on being a spiteful, hateful, unforgiving, resentful person who's just no longer drinking. Okay, so that's a dry drunk. But how do we apply that to Sex Addicts Anonymous? If we're going to be married for the rest of our lives to our spouse, we can't very well just put the plug in the jug. A healthy sexual relationship is what's supposed to be a product of a 12-step recovery process. Learning how to be sexual again in a healthy way, not in an unhealthy way. So we can't just stop doing it. As a matter of fact, if we stop having sexual relations with our spouse altogether, we're either going to end up in divorce or we're going to be living an unproductive, unfruitful, and unloving relationship for the rest of our lives together. And that doesn't sound like something anybody wants. No, that's not what I signed up for. No. And it wasn't an easy process for you and I to learn how to be sexual again, but 
the 12 steps and recovery from both of our sides help us to get to that place again. Mm -hmm. So the essence of a dry drunk is that you can be sober from your acting out behaviors. But you can still be acting like a jerk. That's exactly right. That's a good way to think about the process. It goes deeper than just the action of the addiction. That's right. Because there's always something behind our actions. Okay, so once there's a list of character defects and a list of resentments, then what happens? Any good inventory requires a total inventory of all things that you have. So in this case, instead of just character defects and resentments, there is also a list of character assets. Okay, that sounds positive. Yes, this is also an honest look into yourself about what is good about you. Mm -hmm. By the time we as addicts get to a place where we're on a step four, we've probably got some self-hatred going on. We're seeing a lot of stuff in us that we don't like. That sounds like it could maybe cause some depression or some anger. Yes, it does. Because when you start to see the real picture, it can really make you mad. It can make you mad at yourself. How could I ever let this happen? This is not the person I set out to be. Yeah. So this is a good step because you have to balance it. Yes. So like I said, there's also a list of character assets. Let's look at the assets that you currently have. Ask yourself these questions. Am I a kind person? Am I a helpful person? Am I a thoughtful person? Some of the things that you can come to understand about yourself as you go down the list, you can see is that I am a helpful person. I am a thoughtful person. Or I am a kind person. And those are all really good things to see. I will say this, though. Be careful with I am statements. They're very powerful. They have the power to harm, but they also have the power to heal. Jesus himself makes I am statements. He is God. And when he says I am statements, he's speaking about his identity, but he's also speaking in the present. He didn't say I was, he says I am. Mm -hmm. And so that's so important to remember. Like for me, I was a sex addict, but now I am a recovering sex addict. And how does that make you feel? It makes me feel very peaceful and accomplished to know that I am not a sex addict anymore. It's easy to see in a program where people introduce themselves in the meetings, hi, my name's Johnny, and I'm a sex addict. That could be true if I was still currently acting in my addiction while attending recovery meetings, but I am not. And so I make a purposeful statement to say, hello, my name is Johnny, and I am recovering from sex addiction. There are others in my group who modify it even further, and they will say, Hi, my name is, and I am a grateful recovering sex addict. They want to put that modifier on there, expressing the gratitude for the program that has brought peace and stability to their lives. So all that makes up what it is to work the fourth step. And what it boils down to is that we're really just making a list, and the real action starts in step five. But first, you have to have that inventory to know where to start. Okay, that's really good, Johnny, because... You have to start at the beginning. That's right. I remember when you were going through these lists, you were fearless. I could see that it was a very difficult exercise. But wow, the change that came from it when you did take action. I was amazed. And I continue to be amazed at how you continue to take that moral inventory. And you continue to work through your resentments and release them to God. Every single day, more and more, I see the man that I always wanted to be married to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. One thing that just came to mind, I remember giving you my list of character defects. Yes. And asking you to look them over and see if you agree with them. And my character assets as well, to see if you agree with those. Mm -hmm. You actually went through and red marked up like a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> marks up a kid's page, you know, it's like, no, I don't see it this way, indicating that I was still having some blind spots. Mm -hmm. And I felt that helped me to build an even clearer picture for me to present to my sponsor, because you were meant to be the one who sees my blind spots. Right. My sponsor is only catching up to who I am now. 
you've been there all along. Happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? You going through that exercise was helpful for me too, because I never really did a lot of introspection during my lifetime. And seeing you do it actually gave me courage to also look at myself and see what kind of defects that I might be displaying, what kind of flaws I have, blind spots that I have, and also resentments that I have. And so you going through that was actually super beneficial to me as well. And I think everybody, whether you're an addict or not, can benefit from this type of moral inventory exercise, just seeing where we fall short and then taking steps to change those things into positive character assets. Emily, I couldn't agree more. In this context, we use it for the purpose of coming out of sex addiction or whatever addiction it is that holds on to us. But what I heard you just saying is that every person could take these same principles and apply them to their lives and get some benefit from it if they were honest with themselves. Absolutely. With that in mind, there is a word that I want to share from Scripture out of Psalm 139, verses 23-24 in the Message Bible. And it says, Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. And guide me on the road to eternal life. Wow. My thoughts exactly. <laughs> yeah, that can be a little scary, can't it? It can be. To ask God to get inside of you and look. Well, he already sees it, but for him to show us. Right, and ask him to do it. Yeah. So here's the hope. When we allow God to examine us and speak truthfully into our lives, we can trust that in his faithful nature, he will lead us to a better life, a God-centered life. That's the whole point of this is to have God at the center of our life. That's correct. That makes everything better. It does. <laughs> Why don't we learn that earlier yes. in our lives? That's right. It would be so much easier. Emily, would you pray for us as we close this up and maybe ask God to help us do just that? Yes, absolutely. Heavenly Father, oh my goodness, it says in your word that we should let you examine us and show us where we mess up, where we fall short. And a lot of times we're loath to do that, Father. I ask right now that you give us courage, that you give us that strength of will <laughs> to take those steps, to look inside of ourselves, to have you show us where we need to make changes, where we're having false thoughts and false beliefs, when we're believing in the lies of Satan or of ourselves, and that you would help us ferret it out so that we can turn it all over to you and you can do your miraculous healing. We thank you for this cleansing process. You're the one who makes us clean, and we are so grateful. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity, and I pray that everyone listening would go to Psalm 139, read the whole thing, because in it you show us how wonderful and special we are and how you made us in your image. And when we believe that, going in and getting all the junk out is not going to be as hard as we think. Thank you so much for all of your love and mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Emily, just to quickly recap this, the fourth step of recovery is all about taking a moral inventory of ourselves, revealing our character defects and resentments, turning our defects into assets, and allowing God to help us to be fearless and honest as we do this. That's great. So what do we have to offer our listeners this week? This week, we ask that you would request our resource of the list of character defects to bring an awareness of what might be keeping you from experiencing true freedom from addiction. In our show notes, we'll have a link to a questionnaire that will help you to determine for yourself if you are a sex addict. If you're currently in Sex Addicts Anonymous, keep in contact with your sponsor. And if you're not currently engaged in a recovery program and you need some help moving forward, book a coaching call with me at coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com, and I can help you get started. Okay, that sounds really good, honey. One last thought before we go. Yep. Emily, for step four, we need patience. We need persistence. We need honesty. And we're going to need some courage. But it's also going to take the support of our loved ones mm -hmm. and others with shared experience, as well as our growing connection with God. 
Right. Working the fourth step demonstrates a commitment to our recovery and living in the right now. So be gentle with yourself. It's hard work, but it's worth it. So until next time, marriage is redeemed, hearts renewed on Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before you go, if this podcast encouraged you and you're feeling some hope for today, please share this show with someone else you know who is going through a similar situation and needs to know that they're not alone. One of the best ways that you can help us reach more people is to leave us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. And as always, we would love to hear from you with questions and comments. Just email us at support at beyondbrokenvows.com. As you walk out this journey one day at a time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.